Okay, chapter seven is about injury prevention and safety. There is a safety officer everywhere you work that is in charge of doing annual end services for employees to keep everyone safe and up to date. There are national laws called the OSHA Act that are governed by governmental agency, the Department of Labor, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or the OSHA are the uh, federal laws that help protect employees. And that's at any place that you work, not just in healthcare. So in the back of your book on page 140, there is a poster for the OSHA Act on the uh, Job Safety and Health, it's the law poster that the video is gonna talk about. You do need to know- In 1968, at the height of the war in Vietnam, 14,000 Americans were killed and 46,000 were wounded. That same year, another 14,000 Americans were killed. But those lives were lost right here in the United States because those American men and women were killed at work, on the job. Another two and one half million American workers suffered disabling injuries. That's 54 times the number of people we had wounded in Vietnam that year. Are the subcommittee will be in order and this morning, we're continuing with our oversight hearing for the Occupational Safety and Health. In an effort to stem this tide of injury, disease, and death, Congress created the Occupational Safety and Health Administration in 1970. In creating OSHA, Congress affirmed the right of every working man and woman to safe and healthful working conditions. They have not only the right to expect, it's the law, that they should be able to go to their work in the morning, give the employer so many hours for so much money and be able to go home to their family that night the same way they walk in the door that morning. Okay, so make sure you know about OSHA. It's the federal law that governs employee rights. And this is information about the poster. Since OSHA's creation in 1970, workers have many new rights related to safety and health. OSHA standards which have been issued since then, such as the hazard communication or right to know standard, provide additional rights. Now, let's take a look at the rights you have under OSHA. Have you seen this poster at your place of work? The OSHA Job Safety and Health is the law poster as shown on your screen, outlines some worker rights, including employee. You have the right to notify your employer, or OSHA, about workplace hazards. You have the right to request an OSHA inspection if you believe that there are unsafe and unhealthful conditions in your workplace. You can file a complaint with OSHA within 30 days of retaliation or discrimination by your employer for making safety and health complaints or for exercising your rights under the OSHA Act. You have a right to see OSHA citations issued to your employer. Your employer must correct workplace hazards by the date indicated on the citation and must certify that these hazards have been reduced or eliminated. You have the right to copies of your medical records or records of your exposure to toxic and harmful substances or conditions. Your employer must post this notice in your workplace. You must comply with all occupational safety and health standards issued under the OSHA Act that apply to your own actions and conduct on the job. Employers, you must furnish your employees a place of employment free from recognized hazards. You must comply with the Occupational Safety and Health Standards issued under the OSHA Act. Click the button on the screen to download the poster. Okay, so like I said, you have that poster on page 140 in your book. And just make sure that you know that that is what protects employee rights. Ergonomics is using proper body mechanics. It looks at the relationship between workers and their jobs. It studies uh, studies have shown how job injuries occur, and they occur from repetitive body movements, awkward posture, using wrong equipment, and using equipment wrongly. So we need to make sure that we are using all of the equipment properly. Before you use anything, you have to get checked off on it, and you have in-services 
anytime you get new equipment or every year to make sure you know how to use the existing equipment. And able to develop good work habits, you need to make sure you go to these trainings and you need to make sure you use the, the ergonomics that are taught for you for good body mechanics to prevent you from getting injured. Uh, you have to consider injury prevention and safety on the job. It's an important part of your job and you're never supposed to put yourself or your resident at risk. When you are assisting residents, you're always supposed to use good body mechanics that we're going to learn about. And then accidents are accidents, but some of them can be prevented if we use knowledge and use things wisely. So using common sense can help prevent. The American workplace is becoming safer, but serious injuries still occur in work sites you might think are absolutely safe. <laughs> Nursing homes and personal care, a fast-growing industry and a key part of our health care system. Yet, these facilities have one of the highest worker injury and illness rates in the country. Similar to trucking and shipbuilding, occupations often thought to be more dangerous. Just look at the statistics. Nursing home workers lose twice as much time on the job as other workers and have an overexertion rate more than four times the national average. Over half of their injuries occur while handling residents and almost half involve the lower back. There are many potential hazards in nursing homes. Disease, infection, chemical exposures, slips and falls, even workplace violence. But perhaps the greatest worker hazard involves lifting residents and transferring them from bed to chairs, showers, or other areas in the nursing home. Nursing home workers aren't the only ones who suffer from stress, strain, and overexertion. Such problems account for more than one in four of all on-the-job injuries each year. These disorders are the single largest group of preventable job injuries in the United States today. But when ergonomic principles are applied, everyone benefits. Simply put, ergonomics means fitting the job to the worker. Designing jobs so that workers can avoid awkward, unnatural postures and excessive force that can lead to serious injury and illness, sometimes even painful and permanent disabilities. OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, had a special emphasis program in seven states to reduce the threat of injuries in nursing homes. Now, in line with new targeting procedures, OSHA is conducting inspections in nursing homes nationwide. Employers are encouraged to create comprehensive safety and health programs to reduce injury and illness rates, including those associated with resident transfers. Okay, so you will be doing a lot of resident transfers and what we need to know about are the body mechanics. The principles of body mechanics, things to consider, you're always needing to adjust the height of the bed to a comfortable working position. We always talk about raising the bed up when you're working on it or putting it down low so that the patient can get out of it or when you're sitting down at the bedside doing vital signs. You're never supposed to be reaching over things like the bed rails or tables or people. Get as close as you can to what you need to move or transfer. If you need to put your knee on the bed to get closer to the resident, that's fine. Make sure you always put down the side rail on the attended side. You leave the side rail up on the unattended side, maybe the side you're going to turn them towards so there's no one else on the other side. But the side rail comes down on the side that you are working on and the bed is raised to that comfortable working height. Preparing yourself, you always need to face your work. Your feet should be shoulder width apart with a wide base of support. One foot can be slightly in front of the other for some leverage. Tighten your abdominal muscles, keep your back straight when you're lifting, and always bend at your knees. So bending at your knees is important. You're going to have to strengthen your, your calf muscles and your thigh muscles and do some squats, but you don't need to be bending at your back. Bending at your back is going to pull your back muscles, and your back muscles are weaker muscles than your leg muscles. You need to be using your arms and your legs to lift things, not your back. Some more principles how we're going to move. We're going to get as close as possible to what we're moving. We're going to keep our palms up, facing your palms upward when you grasp something. So grasp it with an upward grasp. 
so that you can use those big biceps in your arms, which are the strongest arm muscles. Um, having the palms up is called supination. Putting the palms down is called pronation. Breathe in deeply before you begin. Breathe out. Don't hold your breath while you're lifting. It gets good blood and oxygen flow to your muscles. And then rock to gain momentum for your lift or your move. Use your body weight to push and pull. Avoid twisting at your waist. Okay. When you are lifting things, never lift objects over your head or above your shoulders. Okay. You should only lift it to the height right at chest height. If you need to put something up on a higher shelf, you need to get on a step stool or a ladder, never a chair or a rolling chair, and try to put things on a shelf that's higher than your chest. It's important to apply the principles of good body mechanics at all times when lifting, moving, and positioning residents. Apply the following guidelines to make your work easier and protect your back from injury. When lifting and moving residents, follow these guidelines and precautions. Wear loose clothing and comfortable non-skid shoes. Plan ahead. Always ask for help from coworkers before lifting heavy objects or residents who are unable to stand. If you are unsure of your ability to assist, request help from a coworker. Elevate bed to comfortable working height for you. Lift resident on a predetermined signal. Return the bed to the lowest horizontal position when finished. Always raise the side rails if you must leave the bedside with the bed in the high position. Use good posture and stand in good body alignment while lifting and moving residents and objects. Keep your back straight. Distribute your weight evenly on both feet. Also, maintain a wide base of support by keeping your feet approximately 12 inches apart. Use the strongest, largest muscles to do the job. Leg and arm muscles are the strongest. Back and abdominal muscles are the weakest. Bend from the hips and knees. Avoid bending from the waist. Always squat to lift heavy objects. Keep residents and heavy objects close to your body when lifting and moving. Use both hands when lifting or moving. Slide, push, or pull residents or heavy objects rather than lifting them when possible. Use adjunctive devices such as a transfer belt or mechanical lift whenever possible. Use your body weight to push or pull heavy objects. Avoid jerking motions. Use smooth, even movements when moving residents and heavy objects. If changing direction is necessary, take a few short steps and turn. Avoid twisting at the waist. Face your work. Avoid twisting your body when lifting and moving. Place heavy items at a comfortable height. Avoid lifting objects from over your head when possible. Avoid reaching and lifting objects higher than your shoulders. Whenever possible, work at waist height. Avoid unnecessary bending and reaching. Pay attention to how your body feels, how you perform certain tasks, working conditions and potential hazards, and aches and pains. Take frequent short rest breaks. Use common sense. Realize your limitations. Learn all you can about the principles of ergonomics and apply them. Ergonomics is the adaptation of the job and workplace to fit the worker's needs. Stay healthy and fit. Get adequate sleep. Avoid repetitive motions. So we're going to learn how to use the adjunctive devices, the gate belt or transfer belt or safety belt. It's called all of those things. It's used for ambulatory patients that are able to stand and able to walk. We're just using it as a guide to guide them. You never hold them up by the gate belt. You never support their weight by the gate belt, but it's used as a guide that you can hold on to and guide them. And we're going to learn how to use the gate belt for the falling next. 
We're also going to learn how to use the lift as an injunctive device. If the patient cannot bear their own weight, they need to be use a lift to get them up, use two people, and then get them transferred. So as far as preventing falls, to prevent or minimize falls, you have to consider all the factors that contribute to a resident's fall. People who are older than 65 years old are at risk for falls. People who have a history of fall will fall again. Falls are the second most common accident in long-term care, and they're the second leading cause of death in people over the age of 65. They're the most common accident in long-term care, second leading cause of death, in people age 65 and older. People don't die immediately from the fall, but they die from complications of a hip fracture or a broken bone. So the most common injury is the hip fracture. Well, right here at the groin, you'll see the head of the femoral head of the femur bone just breaks off and snaps. They usually fall forward. They hit their knee with a lot of force and pressure, and then it breaks their brittle bones. We talked about bones getting brittle as you age because of the osteoporosis and something that's brittle, like peanut butter brittle, when you drop it, it just cracks and shatters, just like their bones will. Stopping a fall. First of all, we are not holding them up by their gait belt. We are steadying them. We are using it to gain balance, but we are not going to support them and hold them up by their gait belt. Okay, once they have been balanced, you can pull them towards you and you're going to lower them to the floor. If their legs have given out, they are going to fall. So you might as well do a controlled fall and slowly, gently lower them to the floor. We're going to watch a video on that. But if you can't get them steadied and can't get their balance, just go on ahead and support them on your knee and slide them down onto the floor. But you are not supporting them or holding them up by the gate belt. Um, assist them to the floor holding on the gate belt just to guide them to the floor. After the fall, if the resident falls or has a controlled fall to the floor, you are not allowed to move them on your own. They may have fractured a hip or broken a bone. If you stand them up and put pressure on it, it's going to make it worse. They may even have a spinal cord injury from a fall. So leave them on the floor, get their vital signs, get them comfortable, occupy them while you're having the nurse or doctor come and do an exam on them before we can get them off the floor. We may even need the lift to put them in the sling and lift them up off the floor. The lifts go all the way down to the floor. Okay? If you find a resident on the floor, do not move them until the nurse comes. And then always call for help first when you find them on the ground and take their vitals. Um, you will have to write an incident report if anybody gets injured. This includes yourself, even if you're not working with a person who's fallen, but you have some aches and pains or you move somebody, turn somebody, pull somebody the wrong way. If you feel like you injured yourself on the job, an incident report needs to be filled out so that we can investigate it. And so that later on, usually the swelling doesn't get worse to 48, 72 hours later, maybe the next day or the day after you're having much more difficulty moving, but we don't know that that injury happened on the job if you didn't write an incident report. When you are writing incident reports, we'll talk about it in the documentation chapter. You need to be concise, you need to be exact, you just need to put the facts. So if you walked into the room and the resident was on the floor, walked into the room, resident was on the floor. Just put the facts. Okay. Due to the medical conditions of residents, falls are a common emergency in healthcare facilities. As a nursing assistant, you may be in a position to help minimize the seriousness of and injuries incurred during a fall. If a resident starts to fall, pull him or her close to your body using the gate belt. Hold the center of the gate belt at the resident's back firmly with an underhand grasp. Keep your back straight. Your feet should be about 12 inches apart and your knees bent. Bend your knees and ease the resident down your legs to the floor. Do not attempt to hold the resident up. This can cause injury to the resident and yourself. Protect resident's head from hitting the floor and control the fall to avoid hitting objects in the area. If the resident is not wearing a gate belt, move close and wrap your arms around the resident's waist or underarms. Pull the resident close to your body, sliding him or her down your leg to the floor. Call for help and stay with the resident while help arrives. 
Perform emergency procedures you are trained and qualified to provide. Okay, so your emergency procedures, if the person is bleeding, you can hold direct pressure on that bleeding area to get the bleeding to stop. You can also help them with uh, breathing difficulties. If they're having difficulty breathing, turn them on their side so that they can breathe better. If they are um, having a seizure, you're going to turn them on their side so they can, if they vomit, they don't aspirate their vomit. And then you're going to get their vital signs while you're waiting on help to arrive. If they need CPR, you're also going to have to start doing CPR on them if they are not a DNR or do not resuscitate, which we're going to talk about in another chapter. So the safety belt or gate belt or transfer belt, it goes on tight enough around their natural waistline, so down near where their pants would be or where a regular belt would be, tight enough where one flat hand or four fingers can fit up underneath it so it's not sliding up and down on the person as you're using it but not so tight that you're cutting off their circulation. If you don't have the gate belt, just grab them like it did in the video, pull them towards you, lower them down your knee to the floor. You're gonna be on the floor with them, so don't fall and hurt yourself. But again, with the leg muscles being the strongest muscles, you have to bend at your knees to get down onto that floor. The next thing is about environmental safety. So wet floors are everyone's responsibility. If you see a wet floor, Put something on top of it and move something over it so that nobody else will trip on it while you go get something to clean it up. So housekeeping does not remove bodily fluids. If, there are, if there's blood or urine or stool on the ground, the nursing needs to pick it up or the nursing staff needs to get it up and then housekeeping will come back and disinfect. So whether you make the spill or not, make sure it's cleaned up appropriately, make sure if it's a tripping hazard, you have identified that area with a sign or a cart or a chair or something so that someone else doesn't trip on it while you've gone to get something to pick it up. The bed cranks. Some of the beds do not have automatic um, things that make them go up and down. They have cranks at the end of the beds. Those bed cranks handles need to be turned back flat and even with the bed whenever you're done with them. So if you leave the handle sticking out, it's a tripping hazard. Somebody walks by the edge of the bed, doesn't realize they're sticking out and can trip over them. If you notice any broken floors on the tiles, any uh, oxygen tubing, any soap, paper clips, paper, trash, put on a glove, pick it up, throw it away. So everybody needs to keep the facility clean. If you notice there are any holes in the walls or anything missing on the baseboards, if there's any damage anywhere, put it in maintenance logs so that they know that they need to go fix it. Your electrical safety. Never use electrical devices around water. If you're giving them a shower, you have to go away from the tub or shower in order to blow dry their hair. A lot of facilities want you to take them back out into the hallway or back into their room to use the hair dryers. Dry your hands before you use electrical equipment. We're going to learn how to do the vital sign machines. They are electrical. Make sure you're not using it with wet hands. Never use extension cords. They are not allowed to have extension cords or outlet expanders. They are trip hazards. They are fire hazards. If they have something that they brought from home, as long as it got checked off by maintenance and says that it's appropriate for them to use, then they can use it, but they cannot have an extension cord. Kind of like we talked about, they can't have plug-in heaters. They can't plug in heating pads and then have an extension cord that runs from their bed all the way to the wall. It's prohibited by law in long-term care to have extension cords. Report any electrical shock to your supervisor and to maintenance. If you're trying to plug in a bed and it shocks you, let the nurse know. We'll put a ticket on it. We'll keep it out of service so nobody else tries to plug it in. Maintenance needs to come fix it as soon as possible. We talked about the call lights. If you wrap them around the side rails, sometimes the wires will start to fray. That's an electrical hazard. If you see any exposed wires in the bedding or in the call lights, you need to let maintenance know immediately so that they can fix it and we don't get electrocuted or the place doesn't catch on fire. If residents bring in their own electrical equipment, they have to have it checked off by maintenance before they're allowed to use it. For chemical safety training, there are material safety data sheets. They're right to know information. By law, you have to know what chemicals are being used in your workplace and what things you are being exposed to. In these MSDS sheets, they're just called material data sheets, MDS sheets now. 
that they've all been standardized so that you can open it up, know what the, it's an alphabetical order, it tells you what, where this chemical is being used, and then it tells you the safety hazards about it. It tells you what you should do in an emergency. For everything in long-term care and the nursing home, like all of the cleaners that we use, the first thing, if you get it splashed or spilled in your eyes or your mucous membranes, is go and find an eye wash station and rinse it out with water. So find your eye wash station, make sure you know where they are, the closest one to you in the bathroom. We saw the little signs about the eye wash stations. Go and clean it out of your eyes for 15 minutes with cool running water, and then go and write an incident report and let your nurse know. Instruct students to... Um, these MSDS sheets help let you know that what's in, what the chemical will do for you, if it's toxic or hazardous. You also need to know that you cannot use containers that are not labeled. So we don't have community containers of shampoo that we pack around. Everybody has their own personal containers of things but you can't put something from a large container into a smaller container that doesn't have a label on it. Emergency first aid, again, for your chemical exposure, see your supervisor immediately after you've rinsed it out of your eyes and your mucous membranes and off of your skin. So follow those guidelines on the MDS sheets. Some 32 million workers are potentially exposed to hazardous chemicals on the job each year. Chemical exposure can cause and contribute to a number of serious health problems. Some chemicals may also be safety hazards and can cause fires and explosions. And other serious accidents, employees have a need and a right to know the hazards of chemicals and drugs they work with. How to read labels and material safety data sheets. The proper personal protective equipment to wear when working with a hazardous chemical or drug. How to properly dispose of hazardous PPE. How to handle a leak or spill. How to be prepared to handle an employee exposure situation. A chemical is considered hazardous if it is labeled as flammable, explosive, high irritant, requires well ventilated area, carcinogenic, corrosive, sensitizing, and target organ effective. In order to protect workers from the potentially harmful effects of hazardous chemicals, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, issued the Hazard Communication Standard. This standard requires that the hazards of all chemicals and drugs are evaluated, and that this hazard information is passed on to affected employers and exposed employees. Compliance with the standard involves creating a written hazard communication plan that outlines how employee information will be distributed and how training will be accomplished. The standard describes the requirements for labels and other forms of warning, such as MSDSs, material safety data sheets. Employees are not expected to memorize information on the MSDS, but they are expected to know where to look such as the hazards, the signs and symptoms of occupational over and the proper PPE to use when handling the product. Communication is an ongoing program, not a one-time effort. In order to have a successful program, the safety officer must provide initial and ongoing training to employees. So the safety officer again is going to help you with these hazard communication trainings. Every year you need to get checked off. Know where the MDS sheets and, or safety safety data sheets are located. They're in a binder, usually a big yellow binder somewhere hanging on the wall with a big sign. You don't have to memorize them, but you have to know how to read them and what you could possibly be exposed to. There are other areas where people work where there are things like powders and things that if they get on your skin, you are not supposed to wash them with water. If you activate them with water, they turn into acids that burn through your skin. To make sure you know what you are working with. If you are using the clavicide wipes, you need to make sure you put on gloves because they are caustic to your hands. If you're using the bleach ones, they can bleach your uniform. So if you are using bleach, you really don't need to be inhaling all these fumes. You need to be wearing PPE or wearing a mask so that you're not inhaling the fumes. So make sure you know what PPE or personal protective equipment you need to use when you're using chemicals and if you've been exposed to chemicals. There's other things as well as far as blood. If you're exposed to blood, there's a bloodborne safety 
hazard training, but you need to make sure if blood spills on you for any reason, you go and wash it off immediately, and then you let the nurse know, write an incident report. Definitely, if you get a needle stick, we have to know that you got stuck by a needle. There are many communicable diseases that are spread through needle sticks that we talked about in the infection control chapter. But that incident report has to be written if you get that needle stick. So we can keep track of you for the next six months to make sure you don't develop hepatitis C or HIV. Um, a blood spill kit is an emergency kit. comes in a little box or a little bag. It's usually in the nurse's cart or in the clean utility room. This blood spill kit has everything that you need to um, clean up a blood spill. So this kit comes with an antimicrobial hand wipe to wipe your hands before you put your gloves on. There is this red fluid control solidifier powder that you open up and you sprinkle on top of the blood. It dries the blood up into a hard like clay and then just sucks it all up so that you can use this little scooper and this dust pan to scoop up the blood and put it inside the red biohazard bag. Once you've cleaned up the big solidified pouch of blood, there is another sanitizer that you can use to wipe off the floor or the surface that the blood was on. And then some other little biohazard bags that if you want to put the rest of your trash in that isn't the blood that is in the, the red bag that needs to be incinerated. So make sure you know how to clean up a blood spill and you also know how to clean up a mercury spill and you know how to clean up any other kinds of spills that are in your workplace. Your disaster preparedness. The best time to plan for a disaster is before it happens. Everywhere you work has a disaster plan book in each facility and each department. So there are policies in place that tell you what to do in case something happens. The biggest one is going to be fire, and we're going to learn about that next. But we also have some for tornadoes. So usually a tornado is the policy, the acronym is RIP, or rest in place. And what we want to do is get people in inward walls, away from windows and doors that could blow and shatter and kill us. You get them in the hallway, get them on the floor, give them some blankets and pillows, and they're resting in place until the tornado is gone. Um, there are emergency codes everywhere you work. Usually code red means there's a fire. Code blue means somebody's having a heart attack. Code green may mean a tornado. Code orange may be elopement or somebody's trying to escape. Everywhere you work has a different code and they will give you this list of emergency codes so that when we call it overhead, it doesn't panic everyone. You're not supposed to run down the hall yelling, fire, fire! We're going to say code red, even though the fire alarm is going off, the residents, patients probably know what's happening, but we're not scaring anyone. Okay, so make sure you know the, the disaster codes for your facility. Your evacuation plan, everywhere you work is going to have an evacuation plan. They have a schematic of drawing up the building that tells you where you are, you are here. This is the closest exit. The exit signs light up at in, even when the power goes out so that you can see it if there's smoke or something blocking your view. Um, there are fire extinguishers throughout the entire building. When the fire alarm is going off, it's our responsibility to grab the nearest fire extinguisher and go towards where the fire was being called. There are fire break doors that if the door closes, you're really not supposed to go through it because if you open a fire break door, it could let the fire spread. The purpose of the fire break doors is to contain you into a wing or an area and prevent the spread of fire into that wing. The priority of movement when we're trying to get residents out if we have to evacuate them for a fire. The evacuation, ambulatory patients go first. What we're trying to do is save as many people as possible. The number one step is rescue anyone in danger. You're going to go to every person that you know that can walk and move on their own ambulatory. Tell them to get up. We're having a fire drill or there's a fire and we need to evacuate. Make sure you stay calm and then direct them towards the closest exit. They can walk, on their, walk by themselves out there. Next, you're going to go get the residents that require wheelchairs and walkers. You're going to help transfer them into their wheelchair. You're going to help get them to their walker and direct them to towards where they need to go. 
And then finally, in the priority of movement, the bedridden patients are last. This is because it takes more manpower to get rid of one person than it does to get all of the other people who can walk and get out on their own. So get as many people aware of the evacuation as possible. Go back for the bedridden people last. Sometimes, if time allows, you may not be able to push the bed on your own. You may have to pull them off of the bed into a blanket and draw. It's called a blanket draw or blanket drag. Drag them down the corridors or down the steps because during a fire, the elevator doesn't work. But put them in a blanket and drag them if you can't push their bed. So the acronym for FIRE, you have to know this acronym. This is the most common one. You will do it every month on every shift and you will have fire drills. In case of a fire, R is rescue. Rescue any residents in immediate danger first. Okay. A is alarm. Alarm means to say code red or pull the fire alarm or get overhead on the speaker on the telephone and say code red, code red in the location or wing that you are in. C stands for contain or close all the doors and windows to contain the fire. Fire needs oxygen to spread. If we contain the fire into a room, it uses up all the oxygen and then hopefully it will go out. If you have an oxygen kill valve in your facility, if you have oxygen being pumped down the halls and it's coming out of the walls, somebody needs to turn the oxygen valve off so that that oxygen supply is not going. We're going to talk a little bit later about oxygen safety and um, oxygen flammability. But C stands for container, and then E stands for extinguish. If you cannot extinguish the fire, you're going to evacuate. But the E for extinguish, attempt to put the fire out. If it's a small fire, you're trained to do so. We've grabbed the fire extinguishers. We're coming towards the fire. We're going to pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep at the base of the fire. You are not firefighters. You do not need to put yourself in danger. A lot of people die from smoke inhalation that they really don't even know is happening. If you can put on some PPE or put some a, a shirt or something over your mouth so that you're not breathing in the smoke would be better. Um, using your fire extinguisher, the acronym is PASS. Pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep at the base of your fire. If nobody's ever used a fire extinguisher, sometimes the fire companies have them that they can train you, they can do fire safety um, when they have old extinguishers that need to be discharged. They do come and check the fire extinguishers periodically to make sure that they have the, the water or whatever it is that they are in them. They have different classes of fire extinguishers. You're not supposed to use a water fire extinguisher on a kitchen fire. But if you use the multi-purpose fire extinguishers that are in the hallways, you can pretty much put out small fires with that. If the fire is on another unit or wing, that's where we're going to evacuate laterally. We're just going to move everybody to another part of the wing or move them past a different fire break door. So we may have to evacuate people, still stay in the building, but go to a different wing or different floor. If the door that you are touching or trying to go through, you're supposed to touch the door first, not the door knob. Touch the door, the wooden part of the door. If it's hot, don't open it because it's already too late. If smoke is coming from underneath your door, do not open the door or you will let the fire spread. If you touch the handle, you may burn your hand. So touch the door first. Clear the residents out of the hallway. Um, for fire safety, just in general, whenever we have things in the hall, they always need to be on the same side of the hall. If you're plugging in a vital sign machine and the nurse's cart is there and the food trays are out and the laundry thing is out, it all needs to be on the same side of the hall so we have a clear path down the hallway. But if you have a fire drill going on, you need to clear out the halls. You need to put residents in rooms and close the door. They don't have to go in their particular room as long as you are putting them in a room, closing the doors and the windows, telling them that there's a fire drill going on and you'll be back for them. And you've moved all the equipment out of the hallway. Make sure the hallways are free of obstruction. This is any time, not just during the fire drill. Everything is on one side of the hallway. Don't leave things in the middle of the hall. And then you're going to report to the nurse's station or wait for further instructions. Whatever your facility's policy is on evacuation, you may go outside and meet in a certain area in the parking lot. 
but you will have a safety officer who will train you every month about fire safety. So make sure you know what to do in case of a fire. Your incident reporting we've already talked a lot about, regardless of whether the incident involves equipment or staff or procedures, anything that happens that is an injury or incident needs to be reported to the nurse immediately. Okay, know what your code cart looks like. In each facility, they have some kind of cart that has some emergency supplies on it. It may contain a suction canister and some oxygen and some needles to start an IV or the defibrillator or the, the automatic external defibrillator or the AED machine. But everywhere has this code cart. When a code is called, someone needs to grab the cart and bring it to the area so that we have supplies that we need to help with the code. Oxygen safety. Whenever you have a patient who has oxygen, you have to pay special attention to them because oxygen is flammable. They have to have a sign on their door. There is no smoking in any facility anymore anyhow, but we still have to have signs on the door that designate oxygen in use, no smoking, or open flames. It's very important that somebody knows where the oxygen cutoff valves are in the building. Usually maintenance will cut it off if there's a fire but oxygen is extremely combustible. You're not supposed to be smoking around oxygen. You're not supposed to be using petroleum jelly around oxygen. You're not supposed to be putting Vaseline on their lips because that's a petroleum product that could catch on fire. So make sure you know this, there's fire safety that's involved with patients who have oxygen. Dropping the oxygen tank, it's a missile, it's compressed gas, it could shoot off and hurt somebody but it could also spark and catch on fire. Always put up your no smoking oxygen and use signs and then make sure that everybody knows that these people are wearing oxygen. You have to have something that your oxygen containers are attached to or sitting in. It's if it's attached to this pocket on the back of their wheelchair and then you wheel them in their wheelchair with it. You cannot carry the cylinders by themselves down the hall. If you don't have a pouch for the wheelchair, you have a rolly little silver metal rolly cart that you can roll your oxygen tank down even if it is empty. It can still conduct a spark and cause a problem. Never put them on the ground because they can easily tip over. Never drop them. So always make sure you're holding them and carrying them. They have a gauge on the top of them that looks just like a gas grill. It's your responsibility to make sure the gauge is not on empty. If you see the gauge on empty, the patient is not getting any oxygen. The flow of the oxygen is this other valve over here that has numbers listed from a half to maybe 10 or 15. You are not allowed to adjust the flow rate of the oxygen. The flow rate of the oxygen is a medical prescription by the physician. Some people have it on a half a liter. Some people have it on two liters. Some people need a little bit more, but that's up to the discretion of the nurse to change the flow meter. You need to turn it off on the top valve. Sometimes they have little tabs where you can turn it. Sometimes you need a little special wrench or key to turn it on and off right here at the top of the stem. Okay. For residents with oxygen safety, we talked about uh, these abbreviations. Your patient may have dyspnea on exertion. That means when they get up to walk around or even when they start talking, they start getting shorter breath. They may not be able to talk in complete sentences. They just have to say yes and no questions and answers. Make sure you report to the resident, to the nurse, if the humidifier bottle is not bubbling. So everybody should have a bottle attached to their oxygen tubing and then attached to the oxygen. This helps to humidify the water or humidify the air so that it doesn't dry out their nose or cause them any bleeding from their nose. Um, if the bottle isn't bubbling and there's water in it, that means they're not getting their oxygen. If the bottle is empty, it needs to be replaced. So if your humidifier bottle is not bubbling, report it to the nurse immediately. This is just an example of the gauge on the wall where oxygen is being pumped through the building, usually like in a hospital. Same thing, there is a dial that turns the flow, but the flow is in medical order and you, you aren't supposed to be messing with the flow. Okay. Uh, patients in the nursing homes have oxygen concentrators. They need to stay plugged in in order to work. 
They're big blue boxes that make oxygen. They still have a humidifier bottle and the oxygen tubing coming off of them, but they need to be plugged in while the patient is using them, plugged in and turned on. So when you go work somewhere, part of your training, they will show you how to use the equipment. You make sure you know how to turn their oxygen concentrators on and off. When they leave the room, you put them on the portable oxygen tank. You turn the oxygen concentrator off so it's not just pumping pure oxygen into the room, which could be combustible. Some people have um, the, the we already talked about their CPAPs, their BiPAPs, their breathing treatments, their nebulizers. All of these machines are going to be emitting oxygen into the air. Make sure the tubing is not kinked so that they are able to breathe. Encourage your residents to take deep breaths and cough and keep their lungs open. If they're all slumped down in the bed, you need to pull them up and reposition them. It's best and easiest to breathe if you are in high Fowler's position. So if you have a patient with dyspnea or you have a patient that's having difficulty breathing, make sure you pull them up and let them sit up in the bed. Using your incentive spirometer, we're going to play with these. These are breathing machines that help people expand their lung volume. Yes, it's going to make them cough. Yes, they don't like to use it, but you can encourage them to use it. If they tell you they don't know how to use it, you don't want to put your mouth on their equipment but you can encourage them to show you how they think they need to use it and then you can help them with using it correctly or you can let the nurse know the nurse or the respiratory therapist can come in and show them, instruct them how to do it again. But you are going to learn how to do it. We usually set a little goal, maybe a thousand, maybe fifteen hundred. And on one side, there is a range of little smiley faces or thumbs up or yes or no. The goal is to suck on this tube as hard as they can to take a deep breath in, but keeping this ball fluctuating inside the good smiley face range, while this ball rises to the capacity of the volume of the lung that we want. So they're just sucking in and taking a slow, even deep breath in to open up their lungs. So try to encourage that. 